I, I, I wake up usually uh, to the sound of the dog whining, <laughs> which, um, you know, is it, is it seven o'clock yet? And uh, Rob usually gets up before seven to take the dog out for a long walk. So then I have something like three quarters of an hour. I suppose doze. I don't rush and get up. Then I start and think about what I'm going to do during the day. I might sit up and read for a little while, listen to the radio, really make sure that I'm feeling sort of OK to get up and leap around, because I do find the mornings feel quite nauseous. I've always got something to do every day. So I would say planning the lunch, preparing the lunch. Like to have lunch while we're watching Bargain Hunt. Um, we're Bargain Hunt fans. We'd love to get on that programme, but I don't think that's going to be possible. You never know. <laughs> I'm very lucky in that I've got a lot of people who like to come and visit us and spend the day with us, and particularly my mates, my spinning mates. And um, I do like to meet up with them. We meet up and we have coffee, and we visit the craft shops and the art shops in Hebden Bridge, which is what we love to do. When I had the secondary diagnosis, I did realise that um, things at home probably were, were going to have to change. We needed to look at the kitchen because cooking is one of my hobbies and always has been, one of my enjoyments. And in February, when I was given another three monthly appointment with no treatment, no chemotherapy, um, I decided that it would be a good idea if we had a new kitchen fitted and had the oven raised up so that I'm not bending down. I was burning myself a lot because I couldn't get down and, and under to, to lift things out of the oven. When I go to my guild meetings, that's the Guild of Hand Spinners, Weavers and Dyers, the meeting's in Skipton, which is, I suppose, about 20-odd miles from here. It takes me about three quarters of an hour to, to drive there. Sometimes, if I'm there for half ten, I've certainly had enough by three o'clock, half three. And the ladies there understand that. I then drive home, but I sit down when I come home, and I'm so full of what, what we've been talking about, what I've learned, who said what to who, what's been happening. I come home with such a buzz. I'm tired, but I'm buzzing. And the fact that I'm spinning, it doesn't involve the emotional side of my brain. When I'm spinning, I've got to concentrate on what my hands are doing, what my feet are doing, what my eyes are doing, what the wool's doing. So that's all one side of the brain, and I'm not thinking about, oh, poor you, you know, you're really tired today. I've got some very close friends who understand exactly what's happening because I tell them. They ask me and I tell them. Um, uh, there's only good, really been one acquaintance who who trots out with the palliative. You look really well today. I'm sure you're going to beat this. I bite my tongue, <laughs> but that's only one person in amongst all my group of friends. And I think it's because, hard as it is, you need to make it sure to your friends and your family what the diagnosis of secondary breast cancer is, which is, let's be honest, it's terminal. There isn't a cure. They can put it off a bit, they can put the dying off a bit, um, but there isn't a cure. But that's made me realise that um, the most important thing is to carry on with the living. I'm not dead yet, and, I, and I, what I want to do. I don't want to spend the next few years of my life, and I hope I've got a good few years, but I don't want to spend them dying. I want to spend them living.